my god, Becky, those spoilers are just so big. Hello, all you raccoons and tycoons out there. Today we're going to be doing a spoiler-filled review of Hercules, featuring The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, it's a lot of The Rock. It's a lot of The Rock. Uh, I said before in my spoiler-free review that it seems a bit like he's auditioning for other roles in this. Uh, he, he looks good. One thing that's kind of weird is his armor is too small for his body. Which kind of makes him look bigger, but it's it's also just kind of a, an odd choice. They obviously did that deliberately. Um, but just, it's, it's rather odd. It's rather odd. Let's move on to the other characters. So, we have his companions. We have the druggie, who adds some comedic elements to it. He has visions of the future, and his visions don't always come out right. You know, they do in the beginning... Which is, uh, which is fun, but then later on they don't, so it just it adds a skeptical layer to the film, which is fun. It's interesting to see an ancient film about mythology that has a layer of skepticism and rationality to it, which is fun. The next is uh, Atalanta, the um, female archer, and she's really a Xena clone. You know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer in leather armor. Uh, it, it, it's unfortunate that they give her a bow. They, they always do that. They always give the, the badass female a bow. And it's because, you know, A, they don't think that she's strong enough to wield a weapon. But bows require huge amounts of upper body strength. I, I mean, that's really quite ignorant. I guess they're playing off the ignorance of the audience to be honest. And second, it allows her to be out of the way of danger. It allows us to be not worried about her because if she's further back, although she gets in there, I mean, it, there's some good fight scenes with her. Um, she looks a lot like Nicole Kidman, which is a good thing. Nicole Kidman's gorgeous, and so is the actress who plays her. Next, we have the traumatized guy. It's a bit much. It, it's a bit much. He's really over the top here. Um, just kind of, wow. Uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the Beast Man thing is... Uh, it's overdone, really. I should have seen that they killed him. They, they kill him at the end. You know, he's the most masculine, so he's the most disposable. Right, um, so it, I was kind of disappointed that I didn't see they would kill him, but they do. Uh, next, we have the I, I guess the, the straight man, the the guy who everyone plays their ideas off of. He's um, kind of the antel. The well, what is he? He's the straight mercenary. He th he throws knives in the fight. And, um, you know, he really is just kind of a, a counterpoint to Hercules, really. Uh, he wants to live like a king. Hercules wants to live like a man. It's just, he's there so that Hercules has this, uh, like, like a common man. And Hercules wants to live like a common man, which is ridiculous because he has all this gold, right? So why wouldn't he just, he would, uh, he could quit earlier. He'd stop murdering people, murdering them in their face earlier if he wanted to live like a common man. I mean... It's rather, it's rather an odd point, but I don't understand why. Uh, it's it's very odd, uh, but but the, that that character is only there so that Hercules can talk about wanting to be a common man, and you know, at a certain point he takes all the gold and runs away, but of course he comes back in the final battle, which I thought was pretty obvious, and I predicted that. While I was watching the movie, um, yeah, uh, I mean, just this rather kind of forgettable performances for everyone who's not Hercules. You know, you have the two kings, um, the the one king who he helps out and who he ends up being the one who murdered Hercules' family, 
which um, it's kind of an interesting commentary on politics, really. I thought that was interesting as well, that it has a skepticism and kind of a, a libertarian sentimentality that these rulers are, are no good, you know? Um, I mean, the, the, the kings... And the raider, the um, the man who turns out to be a, a freedom fighter, they, they really don't have too much to them. I mean, what, what can I say? Um, they weren't wearing watches in the scenes. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they didn't break character in that way. There's an old Italian film where they're uh, doing uh, ancient Rome, and one of the centurions had on a, a digital watch. Uh, it's a reference to that. Um, I mean, they didn't screw up too badly. Overall, there is this theme of skepticism, which is really interesting. You, you, I mean, you hardly ever see this, but all of his monsters turn out to be, you know, metaphors, like the like uh, well, de deceptions, not, not metaphors, they're deceptions. Like the centaurs are just exaggerated stories, and the corpses brought back to life are really men painted as rotting corpses, and the Hydra were bandits who put on masks. They never really explained Hercules' strength, though, which I thought was very strange. Uh, he, he's incredibly strong, you know, supernaturally strong, really. He's supernaturally strong, and they never explained that, and the whole movie's about skepticism. Uh, you know, at one point he punches this guy in the head, but he palmed a arrowhead right, so that he can, he can punch him in the head better, and of course the guy dies instantly because he jammed an arrowhead in his head, but to everyone who's watching, it looks like he just killed this guy with a punch to the forehead, so I was wondering if his great strength would turn out to be another trick, and it wasn't, uh, it, it really wasn't, um, there, there's a, a woman character who hires Hercules, and, you know, of course, she she knows that uh, Her Hercules is, is brought in as apparently someone to repel the invaders, protect the people. Turns out he's aiding the tyrant. And, of course, this woman knows that this man is a tyrant. She is complicit in the deception of Hercules, understands that the man who is now the king is perfectly able to kill children, and uh, she's complicit in all of this. Of course, she's against it, right? Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's a trend to absolve women of any moral guilt, which is really misogynistic. Uh, that, I mean, she, she's the one who deceived him, and yet she acts like she's the wounded party. Uh, you know, she could have told Hercules from the beginning, look, this guy, he's, he's not a good guy. You need to save the kingdom from him. Put my son on the throne. And and then my son will be a good man afterwards. But no, she... You know, and, and again, she's the aggrieved party. Somehow, through some, you know, moral alchemy, she becomes the aggrieved party. Which is kind of bizarre. It removes this libertarian, uh, skeptical perspective. It just kind of... It's like, uh, let's apply basic moral rules to women. Please, can we, can we do that? Is that too much to ask? Am I now going to get attacked by a Sarkeesian lady? Boy? I don't know. Um, what else? Uh, I like how Cerberus was kind of a, a metaphor. They, they didn't really play on it too much. It wasn't... It, it seemed like they could, could have played on it. The, the whole twist thing was, um, you know, going from he was helping the the good king defend his kingdom to a tyrant conquering his kingdom it was just, I didn't see it coming, to be honest. I, I always, I'm pretty good at seeing things coming because I understand the formulas, right? They have to they have to hit this beat and this beat and this beat. Um, I didn't see that coming, and so so I was fairly impressed with that. One thing that I was really impressed with is there's a statue of Hera when he first goes to the king's kingdom. The king's kingdom. The king's stronghold. 
and it's enormous. It took like five years, you know, just kind of this ridiculous totem to, um, you know, can a statue of a woman be a phallic symbol? Probably in some kind of feminist theory it can be, but it just kind of like, wow, you guys are really making up for the fact that you had so many starvations. It's like, look what a great city we have. We have statues of Hera. Anyway, it's a Chekhov gun. He throws it at the uh, enemy king. Well, he tips it over, which I, I thought it was very well done Chekhov gun. Um, usually I can spot the, the Chekhov gun. So Chekhov gun is uh, uh, the, the uh, playwright Chekhov said, if you introduce a gun, if you place a gun above the mantle in the first act, <clears throat> you must fire it in the third. And so you, you have to introduce these elements before you use them. And it's, it's really hard to introduce them in a way that the audience, well, the, the, the audience that's paying attention doesn't realize that they are going to be used later again. I guess that's really everything. The, the boy is a little bit stereotypical, you know, in some way. Uh, it expresses his admiration for Hercules and then squeals the rest of the movie. Which, I mean, he's, he's being attacked, but... Uh, it's just um, kind of weird, you know. It's kind of kind of cliche. I guess that's about it. Thank you for listening. Uh, stay tuned for more authoritarian stuff coming out of me. And remember to brush your teeth. Bye bye.